Good afternoon. Today we're going to talk about how to measure and classify angles and we're going to talk about angle congruency. Most of this is going to be review for y'all because I feel like in previous years you've had some really good foundation with angles, but it never hurts to go back and review. The first thing I wanted to do is um, talk about rays and angles. We've already talked about rays. We did that on the first day and we talked about how it has an endpoint and extends infinitely in the other direction. We also talked on the first day about how an angle is comprised of two rays that share a common endpoint. And we call that endpoint a vertex. The rays form the sides of the angle. I feel like that's very straightforward. If you need to write these definitions down, go ahead and pause the video and then you can start up again once you have them written down. So there's some nomenclature that you may or may not have covered in previous years. As I said, the, the rays form the sides of the angle and we could label them ray A, B, A, and ray B, C, always starting with the endpoint, and the arrow is always over the point that extends towards infinity. The vertex in this case is B, and then we can name this angle a lot of different ways. I could name this angle based on its vertex. I could put a number inside there and call it angle one, I can label the angle based on the three points, any three points that comprise that angle, knowing that the vertex always has to be in the center, but whether I name it ABC or angle CBA, they are identical. We do want to be careful with only using one letter, the vertex, when naming an angle. That works fine if the angle is in isolation, but if the angle is, is built from other lines, then it can be ambiguous to only use the vertex, and in those cases, you'll have to use all three letters, and I will point those out when we get to one. I also wanted to point out some vocabulary. We have the angle itself. We have the exterior, so any points that are not on the line and are not in, inside, the, inside the walls, if you will, of the angle are considered exterior points. Point D is an exterior point. And an angle also breaks the plane into a part cons considered the interior part of the plane. And point E would be a point on the interior. So we can just practice using some of this vocabulary. And that's what we're doing in example two. Pardon me. I wanted to explain to you that we, in this case, could not name this angle just angle B because there are actually three angles that are available for us to work with in this diagram. We have the angle that I've sort of sketched in blue, angle ABD. We also have angle DBC, which is um, highlighted in orange. And then these two angles also have a larger angle with point D being on the interior. And that larger angle would be angle ABC. So in this, this case, you could not talk about angle B because when you did, I would not know which of those three angles you were specifically referring to. All of this is to say that we have an angle addition postulate, much like we did with the segments. An angle addition postulate says that if D is on the interior of an angle, then angle ABD plus angle DBC will together form angle ABC. It's pretty intuitive, so I'm hoping that what we, the work we did with the segment addition postulate will transfer to the angle addition postulate fairly seamlessly. In example four, we are going to do a, uh, use an example, or we're going to solve some problems that involve using that angle addition postulate. In this example, we are given uh, my PQ, ah, PQS, which is the entire angle. We're also given the measure of PQR, which in this case is my orange angle. And it's asking me to find this blue angle, angle RQS. To do that, we're going to use the, seg uh, the ad angle addition postulate, pardon me. And the reason I'm gonna use the angle addition postulate is because I notice in this one, I'm given the whole angle measure, I'm given a part of the angle, and I'm asked to find on the other part. So it lends itself well to the angle addition postulate. So I wrote out what the angle addition postulate for this particular example would be. And now I'm gonna do some substitution. I'm gonna substitute the measure of PQR into here. And then I am going to um, leave 
RQS, this, this as a variable or as a representation like this, because we don't know that value, that's what we're looking for. But we do know that the whole angle, the measure of RQ, this should say PQS, that's what I get for trying to work ahead. This would be 77 degrees. And now I have an algebraic equation that is workable and has translated our geometric equation that represented the picture into numbers that we can work with. So I just subtract, I'm gonna subtract 32 from both sides, and that leaves me with the measure of RQS being 45 degrees. And now we have answered the question that we were given. It's pretty straightforward. This is an uber easy example because you'll notice it was just numeric. There were no variables involved other than our unknown measure of RQS. There are more interesting examples. This is barely one of those, but it is a slightly more interesting um, example. Again, I am given the measure of a part, a, or the whole thing, the measure of angle AOC. Um, I'm also given a part, the measure of angle AOB in algebraic terms instead of an actual number. And then I'm additionally given the measure of BOC. So again, because I have two parts and a whole, I'm gonna use the segment or the angle addition postulate. I'm gonna substitute the representation for angle AOB, which was X plus 10. I'm gonna to add to that the algebraic representation for BOC, which was X. And then finally, I'm gonna put the measure of the entire thing, which we said was 70. And from this, I'm gonna create an algebraic equation that I can solve. I add my two variables, combine like terms. So if we're doing a proof, I would put combine like terms. And I would try to actually spell it. The next thing I would do is I would subtract 10 from both sides. That's the subtraction property. And I end up with 2x equals 60. And now I'm gonna use the division property to isolate my variable. And I end up with x equals 30. I'm not done in this particular case. I mean, I'm close. I know that the measure of angle BOC is gonna be 30 because the measure of BOC was x and x is 30. So I can go ahead and fill this in. You'll want to always remember to put your degree marks if we're talking about the measure of an angle. We do not need degree marks if we're talking about the value of a variable, but because this is the angle, I do need those degree marks. I can also find the measure of angle AOB. That was equal to x plus 10. I know that x is 30, so this angle comes out to being 40 degrees. And of course, we did have to solve for x, so we know that it's 30. And you'll note I did not put a degree sign there, but I did for the actual angle measures. And folks, that's using the angle addition postulate. The only thing I could do to make this more complicated would be to make this a quadratic equation, perhaps, or a system of equations. But the general premise, the geometry behind it, is pretty straightforward. The next thing that we're going to tackle is a way to classify angles by their measurements in degrees. There are technically two ways to classify angles. We can classify them by their angles, those are angle measures. We could also classify them by the lengths of their sides, and that is not something we're doing in this unit. These, I'm hoping, are terms that you're all very comfortable with. The only thing you might not have seen before is that when angles have the same measure, they are said to be congruent. And we denote that with that equal sign with a squiggly over the top of it. We talked about that in the last lesson, but just in case you had forgotten or um, were unsure what that meant, here it is in actual writing. And then we describe the four different types of categorizations for angles based on their angle measure. Those would be acute angles, right angles, obtuse, and straight angles. Straight angles might um, be the only one that is a little bit new to you, and that is basically saying that if you have three points on a line, that line also constitutes a straight angle. All right, I'm not gonna belabor those because again, I feel like we are 
pretty attuned to those. We can do some examples where we're asked to classify angles. I name this particular angle PIG, angle pig, or because it's an angle in isolation, I could also call it angle I. Its degree measure is 35, and it is an acute angle because this measure is less than 90. I'm gonna let you take a look at the remaining three examples. They are very straightforward, I hope. The only thing I wanted to point out with our right angles, folks, is that you must be told that an angle has a measure of 90 degrees, or you must see the perpendicular right angle box shown at the vertex of the angle. Even if an angle looks like it absolutely has to be a right angle, we never presume that unless we are given facts that support that conjecture. All right, so that's it about talking about measures. Let's see what else we can do. All right, continuing with the theme of angles mimicking and uh, sharing a lot of the same operation or properties perhaps that segments do, let's talk about an angle bisector. An angle bisector, the bisector is a ray, a line, or a segment that splits an angle into two congruent angles. And it operates much the same way that our segment bisector did. We can do some math with an angle bisector. And we can also, um, this is pretty trivial, this angle bisector, which is ray x, z. Notice I started with the endpoint x, and I put the arrow above the point that indicates which direction it is continuing to infinity. And I notice that ray x, z splits my angle into two congruent parts. And I would write that as angle w, x, z is congruent to angle z, x, y. My blue angle is going to measure the same as my orange angle. I love using color. It makes, uh, makes sometimes it makes it easier for me to see what's going on rather than just the nomenclature. So let's look at a, a diagram and then we're going to do some math associated with these. So in this picture, it says that FG, this ray, bisects angle EFH. Based on that word alone, folks, I know some things. I know that angle EFG is going to be congruent to angle GFH. That comes from the word bisect. And I know that because I have two angles and there is a larger one, I know that I have the always the uh, always have the option of using the angle addition postulate, and in this particular case, it would be the blue angle plus the orange angle equals the large angle EFH. So, what do some problems look like? Well, in example eight, which we're going to work, I notice that I'm given the blue angle EFG, and I'm also given the orange angle GFH. So in this case, I've got two parts of an angle. I don't have the whole thing, so I'm not going to use the angle addition postulate. Instead, I'm going to use the definition of an angle bisector, and I'm going to recognize that these two angles are going to be congruent. We've already written that congruency statement up here, so I'm not going to write, I, fine, I will. I'm going to write the measure of angle EFG is equal to the measure of angle GFH. And what I've done here, folks, is I went from a congruency statement given to me by the definition of an angle sector to an equality symbol, and I added measure to the front of my angle names. And what allows me to do this is the definition of angle congruency. All right, so once I have an equality symbol, then I can do some algebra. I'm going to use substitution. I wrote that on the same side, but we know that equal sides, sorry, on the wrong side, we know equal signs, the left, uh, what's on one side has to be the same as the other side. So excuse my flip flop here, but these are still congruent statements. All right, so once I have done this, I'm gonna solve it algebraically. I'm gonna subtract three X from both sides. That's using the subtraction property. And that leaves me with 25 is equal to two X minus 10. I'm gonna use the addition property to add 10 to both sides. And then lastly, I'm gonna divide, using the division property, I'm gonna divide by two, and I end up with 35, oh, that should be a two, not a three, 35 divided by two. Folks, 
In high school, we leave things as simplified fractions. This is a simplified improper fraction. We do not use decimals. Only very rarely will you ever see me write something as a decimal. And certainly we never write things as decimals if they are not terminating decimals. In this particular case, I would also say that you could write this as 17.5, and that would be equivalent to 35 over two, but I'm typically pretty lazy, and I don't do the extra step of writing this as a decimal if I don't have to. And I, you will notice that I often leave my answers as simplified fractions. All right, so that was a pretty good example of where we have are given two parts of an angle, and we use the fact that they are congruent to solve a problem. If I look at example nine, I'm given angle GFH, which is my blue angle, and I'm also given the entire angle, angle EFH. So in this case, I can't set these equal to each other. This is the whole thing, and this is only part of it. So I'm not gonna be able to use directly the definition of an angle bisector. However, to use the angle addition postulate, I notice I'm missing a piece. I don't have an algebraic representation for my orange angle. Not explicitly, that is. But because I know from the definition of angle bisector that my blue angle is equal to my orange angle, then what I can do is I can use my angle addition postulate and I can say that the measure of angle EFG plus the measure of angle GFH is, I'm going to add these, and I'm going to set it equal to the measure of angle EFH. I know EFH, so I can substitute that in here. I know the measure of EFG. It tells me that this is 3x plus 20. And then when I'm confronted with filling what the measure of GFH is, I need to remember that these two angles are congruent. And so I can use this 3x plus 20 here, and that is going to be the same, because these are equivalent and congruent angles, I can just use that representation twice. All right, so that's how we build the angle addition postulate using the definition of an angle bisector. Then from here, this is, this is the geometry. This is the substitution, and doing my substitution requires me to understand a lot about the geometry. The rest is just algebra. And if I wanted to formalize this as a proof, I would say that this step is definition of congruency. This step is substitution. Here I've combined like terms. Next, I'm going to subtract x from both sides. Subtraction property. I'm going to use traction property again. And lastly, I'm going to use the division property. And I've identified the value of x based on definition of angle bisector and the angle addition postulate. That's it for today, folks. I hope you enjoyed this lesson and the opportunity to do a little bit of math, and we'll see you again soon.